As you know, I always have a real treat for you. Today's no different. Darius Mershazadeh, what's cracking? Nothing, man. Happy to be here. Now, if you guys don't know who this dude is, he's part podcast host, part CEO, part best-selling author, and part Mershazadeh. <laughs> what is that? What is that name? It's Persian. Persian. Khodafes. Oh, I love it. Do you want to know what it means in, in Farsi? It means descendant of the royal king. E. That's yeah. a cool last name. It's pretty cool, yeah. So you wrote a book. You uh, do some programs. You help some entrepreneurs. Best-selling author. Yada yada yada. What'd you do in the very beginning? Like, <sighs> like, did you grow up rich? Oh no, no. I mean, I grew up. You know, it's funny. I grew up. I thought up, you were a descendant of the king. I, you're right, right. But they took that shit. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I grew up uh, upper middle class, but my but and it's like, it's kind of a long story. But essentially. Uh, when the revolution happened in Iran, I was born in the United States, moved to Iran with my family and then moved back when they took hostages. I was young. I was two years old. Um, but so my dad started gas stations just from the ground up. He was a grinder entrepreneur. I grew up with a father who was an entrepreneur. Would you go down there with your friends and get all the candy you wanted? <sighs> no, 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 no. I was the gas station attendant. Yeah. No. Was it the kind of gas station you just rolled out and filled up their tank and wiped down their windows or was it the little quickie mark kind? It had like a, it had, my, my dad was a hustler, right? So it had like a little, a little mini mart. We had, we did propane so, tires, all that stuff. So did you used to snatch food out the store or no? Uh, you know, so my brother and I, we spent every one, I have a twin brother who was my business partner uh, over the years. And so we spent every summer from age 10 to 18 working as gas station attendants. So no, but you didn't, you didn't, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no. I stole tons of shit. What about your friends? Would they come in and swipe? No. So my, my dad's gas station was probably about 30 miles away from my house. So it was in Riverside, California, and I lived in Orange County. So my friends never saw set foot in one of those gas stations. Good uh, for them. But no, they, they didn't come in. Gotcha. So, so you would go out and just snatch shit off the shelf. Like you own the place. It, it, you know, I actually was way more sneaker than that. I'd go to the back where it was store where we stored everything and just snatch it off that shelf. before, before it even got unboxed. Exactly. Gotcha. <laughs> so, so keep going. Cause I don't want to interrupt you, but I want to know if you, cause if I were a kid working at a gas station with all those candy shelves that you see at these quick marts, yeah. dude, I'd be freaking snatching them all. Yeah. You know, dude, my dad was like, no, you guys need to work. So I was cleaning gas station bathrooms, pumps, full service. And it was boring. You're sitting around a gas station all day. You're 11 years old. This is in the 90s, right? So, you know, I'm like bored out of my mind. So now I just kept myself busy. Dude, that's child labor. Yeah. Well, you know, he, but my dad was great about it because he would convince us that he was going to pay us and then he'd renege on the pay. So he's like, yeah, I'll pay you a quarter an hour, which is like, you know, minimum wage by two bucks an hour then. And then he'd renege on it. But yeah, no, no, I, I, it was, it was my first experience with entrepreneurism. And I was taught to grind. I was taught to work hard. My dad, you know, he, he did pretty well for himself. He owned a, a bunch of gas stations. And then he got sick when I was 18 um, and had to sell them all. And by the time I was 22, my dad actually passed away when I was 22. Um, but I was brought up, I was lucky. I was brought up watching someone be an entrepreneur. And I was like, all right, I can go get a job or I can go like do my own thing. And I learned, I actually learned I had a job at the White House which was, was, which was when I made the decision that I would never have a job ever again. And, and I said, well, the only way I'd ever come back to the white house is if I was the president. Um, but I, yeah, I'd started off, you know, just grinding, hustling. Um, I, do you remember the TV show, um, in living color? Mm -hmm. So they had a skit on in living color about this Jamaican family where they had like, everyone had like a bunch of jobs, right? Do you remember the skit? No. Okay. So, so the, so the, there's like, Oh man, you only have six jobs. I have seven jobs. And so when I was in college, my friends would call me a Jamaican cause I had so many jobs. So I was just always working and grinding and side hustling before side hustle was a thing and knowing that I wanted to start my own company and it got me, it led, it led me down the road of getting actually in the mortgage business. Um, and when I was 25, I started my first mortgage company, the old mortgage business. <sighs> you know why they call it a mortgage? No. A long time ago, there was a man by the name of Morton Gage. That's where mortgage comes from. Really? People think the word mortgage, but it's actually Mort for Morton Gage. I thought it was a French word. No, it's Mort 
from Morton and okay. Gage, and he would loan people money for homes, and okay. so you would have to pay him back every month. So you would pay your Mort Gage. <laughs> Is that a true story? No. Okay. I'm like, I'm like, I think more is means like death. It's like till you die. I made that up one time at this event I was at. <laughs> I, I made it up on the spot and I literally had a whole bunch of people in the mortgage industry laughing their ass off and then a whole bunch of them believe in it. Oh <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I think it's French, <laughs> but the old mortgage business, yeah. there was a lot of money in it though. Yeah. Look, I was 20 years old and I actually got introduced to it. So like I said, I have a twin brother who was my business partner. And when we were 17, 16 years old, um, I was a competitive wrestler, wrestler, wrestle in college. My brother was like not a great athlete, but he was, he was a hard worker. So rather than work at the gas station, we could get our own jobs. So he got a job at a mortgage company in Orange County. And my brother was a guy that people were like, yeah, he's going to end up in jail or, you know, like destitute. He was just a guy, troublemaker, ADD, but he finds this job as a telemarketer in a mortgage company. And I kid you not, man, it was like, God had been like, here's what you're born on earth to do to sell. And he would outsell, he would like, he was 80% of the sales of the whole call center for one, one human. And, and so when, by the time I graduated college, he's making a hundred grand a year. And I'm like, all right, I can go get a job. I'm going to do that. What he's doing. He's making six figures, he's 22 years old. I'm going to do that. So that's what led me down that road. Um, and we ended up, you know, becoming business partners when we were 25, we're twins. Um, the name of the company was twin capital mortgage and we grew that company again, we're 25, so we didn't know shit, but we grew the company. Um, and this is in 2003 when we started it by 06, we grew it to it was number 40 in the Inc 5,000, 40th fastest growing company in the United States. We grew to about 150 employees. It was almost 10 million in revenue. And, and I learned a lot about how do you grow companies? That was my first real success uh, as a CEO and as an entrepreneur. Um, and, but you know, unfortunately, as many people know, you know, 2007 was not a kind year to that industry. So I was at the, I, I was a subprime mortgage lender and we got crushed. I mean, I, I, I when I was at the Inc 5,000 conference, I used to joke that I was the 40 fastest shrinking company in the United States at that conference. And I went from about 150 to 10 employees in 90 days and was almost blew up the company. So talking about bombs, like that was a bomb that blew up in my company and it, it was painful. You know, we really had to like, it, we, we went into five years of entrepreneurial purgatory uh, where we didn't make any money for five years. So I, I learned a lot from that. And how'd you survive? Well, as far as financially or as far as like yeah. as business wise, if you didn't make any money, how'd you eat, feed your family? Did you have a family? <laughs> yeah. Well, at that, at that point I had just got, I got married in 07. Um, I didn't have right when it took a shit. Right, my wedding was in October of '07, and my business imploded in August of '07. Maybe that's why, dude. <laughs> you know, no, I don't know. You know, God's like, don't do it, man. <laughs> no, no, my wife's my wife's the bomb, man. She, she, she. Stood. Well, if you're still with her, then man, it was the best decision you ever made because that's rare. Yeah, she, she. I had a lot of friends who I saw them going through divorces because of the, of what was going on. Like their, right. their, their significant others walked away from them. E dirty in, dogs. Yeah. In the depths. I saw them like turn their backs on them. Dude, listen, if anybody leaves you while you're down and out. Yeah. They're not for you. No, it, to me, dude, it makes me like, just want to use that whole scenario as fuel. Yeah to get rich AF. Yeah. Cause uh, that's it, the best revenge. The, you know, the <laughs> ultimate revenge on anybody. What's that? Get famous. Yeah. I like that. I love that. Like, like you become a movie star or some big yeah. freaking everybody <laughs> loves you deal where you're, you know, just whisked around like a celebrity. Yeah. You're like, look what you left behind, baby. Ultimate revenge. <laughs> <laughs> ultimate revenge is a big success, right? Um, so no, no, my wife stepped up, man, hard. Like, like I was going through like, like really bad anxiety and she was like a rock. She went, you know, she, Did she slap you around and say, snap out of it. No, no, she was, she was not, she's not like that. She was like, she was just really supportive and really helpful. Did y'all have to eat green beans out of a can? No, you know, so, so one of the things that, that I think has served me well is, is I knew that mortgage was you know, pretty cyclical. I didn't trust it. So even, so we started making a lot of money and I was, I just didn't spend it. 
I saved a lot of money. I left a lot of smart. Yeah. So I left a lot of money in the company though. And that all went to zero, but I'd taken enough chips off the table where I could literally almost make no income for five years. And like, I wasn't destitute. Now I wasn't killing it. It was it. You want to talk about a total mind fuck. Is it okay if I drop F bombs? I guess I already have at this point. Uh, yeah, it was a mind fuck, you know, to wake up every day and pivot and try and to go and just not be successful. But around that time, I had got introduced to like this, the world of scale. Like how do you scale a company? And I, and I, I wasn't, and, and I want to get to that because how do you scale a company? Well, so in 06, when I was, this company was peaking at that point, 06 was our biggest year. And then 07 was supposed to be in then it ended up imploding. Um, I was, I was 20, you know, I was 25, man. I didn't know or at that point I was 27. I didn't know what I was doing. It's not like now, not, there's not like, you know, companies like Lightspeed, like your company with where people can go online and learn stuff like that didn't exist then. What year was it? This is 06, 07. I mean, I was around in 99. So it did exist. Your, your company did, but, but I mean, it it wasn't like commonplace to go online and learn stuff like that. That, That's a fact. That's what I meant. I didn't mean as far as your company existing, but, but it wasn't because when I started this bitch, no one was doing it. Yeah. It took me like eight years for it to finally start catching on. So it would have been 08 before it started catching on. Yeah. It wasn't like, Oh, Hey, I'm going to go join a mastermind for scaling companies and learn online. Like that didn't exist. I was in San Francisco at the time. Like, like talk about a place where like young entrepreneurs were at. I was the only person I knew that was an entrepreneur back then. So there wasn't a lot of opportunities, but I went and I was like one Friday night, I was just, you know, just getting my ass kicked and I'm, and I have about 60 employees at the time. And I'm like, man, there's gotta be a better way. And I found this, the, you know, back then you would get a magazine. So I got Inc. Magazine. And on Inc. Magazine, I saw this, this ad for this program at MIT called Birthing of Giants, which was like under age 40, top entrepreneurs from all around the world come together for a three-year program. So I apply for this program and I get in. And, and it changed my life, man. Like I started working with a guy by the name of Vern Harnish who ran the program. Yeah. So Vern. Yeah. Dude, so he's a major. Yeah. So Vern, it's Vern, Vern founded the program and it, he, it's a, every year they graduate a class for three, every three years. And so Vern became one of my mentors and That's I, a good mentor to have you great dude. Talk about luck, right? That's like God shining down on me, dude. Old Vern Harnish. Yeah. So I became a Vern disciple and And so, but unfortunately my business imploded before I could really use a lot of it, but I started playing with it and toying with it. And and in the year three of that program, we graduate and I'm surrounded by 60 badass entrepreneurs. Some of these people were running like billion dollar companies, right? So how how well do you know Vern? I know Vern pretty well. I mean, talk about Vern in the book, the core value equation. Tell Vern I want him on my podcast. I will tell Vern that. Yeah. So I, uh, I, Vern actually, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So, so I, the, the night before graduation, we're in a room with 60 entrepreneurs and, and, and they said, stand up if your company has core values in this program. And the guys running at these two guys, one guy's name's Ken Sims. He's running for uh, mayor of Vancouver right now and John DeHart. And they run this company called nurse next door. One of the top companies in Canada. Um, and, and, and they're running this thing. They got this core value driven company. It's a great company. And they said, you know, stand up if your company has core values. And so we all stand up and about half the room is like scaling up case studies for Vern, right? These are like the like creme de la creme of, of the scaling up world. And, and I stand up and he says, stay standing. If you know your company core values, you can see them off the top of your head. Half the room sits down. And, and of course I'm, I'm one of these folks that sits down. And it was like a gut punch. I just built the core values for my company like a year before, rolled them out. And I'm like, shit, man, like, I can't believe this. Now, what, ha- what's ha- what happens next kind of changes my life. He, half the room's still standing. They say, stay standing if your employees know, know your core values, they can say them off the top of their head. Half the remaining half of the room sits down. This is the punchline. He goes, stay standing if your customers know your core values. Everyone sits down. And I was like, this is weird, man. 
Like, how is it possible that all these people that I respect, they don't know their values, their customers don't, their employees don't, something's got to change. So I went down this road where I started experimenting with core values, like, like aggressively over the next five years. Like, how do you make them where they can come to life in the organization? You know, which is important. Totally right. Like the, the definition of core values are the fundamental beliefs of a personal organization. Yeah. You want to hear, you want to hear ours? I'd love to hear them. Now I want you to tell me if they're, if they're good or not. Now you see the ones. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Oh, the, they're, they're all number one. That's right? right. That's, that's to begin with. I love that. They're all number one. I love that. We are ethical. I believe that with every ounce in my bones. We're, we work as a team. We keep our word. We're excellent at what we do. We move fast. We communicate. We stay positive. We always show respect. We solve problems, not cause them. We take ownership and we seek constant improvement. And we absolutely love our customers or our clients. Dirty dozen. I dig them. Can I, you want me to get, get, be critical? Now, if you'd have said, hey, can you memorize those? Yeah. Well, memorizing them doesn't mean shit if they're not implementing them. Right. So again, I, I have them memorized by behavior. Right. In other words, I, I, I might not, and I could memorize them. I just never have. I know that if you're not communicating, that one of them is communicate. Right. I know that one of them is we keep our word. I know one of them is we love our clients. You see what I'm saying? Like, I know what they are. Well, they're probably how you show up. But at the, at the same time, you know, when you have 13, 15, 20, 12, I got 12 core values. How are you supposed to like make everybody be able to recite them? And, yeah. and is reciting them more important than implementing them? No. So, so, so I believe that, that like, if I was like to, to be critical of those, I would yeah, say be critical, critique them. I would say that they're not designed to be remembered. And then there's a design flaw there. So could you take that for me as a consultant and get me back to fricking where those come alive all day long? Now see that would be valuable. Yeah. All day long. So, the, so I believe that what was wrong in that room that day is that no one teaches, how do we make them come to life? They just say, you got to say what you stand for. Yeah. Or recite them. That's what I hear yeah, people or recite them, but no one's going to remember that. There's I know, a, but dude, I hang around a lot of entrepreneurs and, yeah, and they got it, their core values, but they're just remembered. They're, they're, they're not implemented. Yeah. They don't live behind what they're saying. They're just saying it cause they sound good. Yeah. We strive to be better people every day and make our customer and they can recite them. Yeah. And they force their customers or, or their, their employees to know them so they can prove to guys like you, we know them, but guess what? Yeah. Living by them and knowing them are two different things. Yeah, total. Gave myself a bomb yeah, on that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Well, so to your point, like making them come to life. And what I talk about in, in, in the book, which we'll get to in, in the book, folks, the core value equation. Yeah, what, what, I, what I realized what was wrong in that room and MIT is that no one teaches us how to make them come to life. They just say, hey, go, go figure out what is authentic to your organization write down your 12. I wrote six down 76 words. It's probably 90 words on that sheet that you just showed me. The human brain can't remember that much. So there's a thing called Miller's law. The human brain can remember seven items plus or minus two. And so what I figured out was missing in the next morning, I, by the way, the next morning when I'm sitting in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I had six values, 76 words. I couldn't tell you what one of them is right now. They were authentic. They were what I cared about, but I couldn't tell you. But I said, you know, man, we care about four things in this company. Working hard, do work. Doing the right thing, live zen. Being innovative, break the box. Caring about the customer, wowing everyone. Do work, live zen, break the box, wow everyone. And then I just below that described what that meant. But I gave myself these anchors to remember them by. And they were true. And I brought them back to my organization. And yeah, it was a small Maybe organization. Anyone can adopt those. Well, yeah, but they're Those are good ones. Why can't just a company adopt yours? Because... I believe that core values have an opportunity to become the language of accountability for an organization. And there's a way your organization talks and there's words that are specific to your organization, but you got to figure out what that is for yourself. Cause it's different here than why like, can't I hire you to do it? Of course I'll, I could do it for you. You know, some people do, you know, and, and by so, the, and by the way, folks that are listening, 
because I got a lot of people listening. And a lot of them are entrepreneurs with businesses. I'm saying that the core values are important to implement. Of course, you have to know them. This dude here will help you develop them. Yes or no? Oh, yeah. That's what we do. I mean, you know, we do it for all sorts of companies now. You know, the issue is this. You got to discover what's authentic to you. You have to design them to be viral and sticky in your organization. You got to roll them out so you can indoctrinate your team in them. And then you got it. And then after that, once you roll them out, you have to make them come to life. And there's some ways that we recommend you do that. Last but not least, why do any of it if you're not going to get results? You got to measure for results. And you do those five things and shit happens. And that's basically what the book talks about. The book, I'm, I'm leapfrogging though. The book came after, after the book I put out in 2020. You know, I'm well, going to read it though. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. I need to figure out how to get my core values where they're, where they're like anchors. Man, I could do that for you. No problem, man. I'm happy to help. Well, let's get started. Let's shut this podcast down. <laughs> Boom. Grab Folks, the team. You know where to find them. No, just joking. Grab the team. No. So I figured that out and then I started experimenting with them, but I had my next, I ended up shutting that company down, Twin Capital. I shut the company down in 2010, January 10. And I, and I was in the middle of this pivot where I'm pivoting and trying to figure out what the hell, you know, I got to make money, right? It's only five years of entrepreneurial purgatory. At some point you got to make money. And I had made a lot of money. So I knew what that tasted like and felt like, and here I was not doing it, but I had figured out this one thing. How the hell do you make core values come to life? I spent a lot of time. I figured it out. And in 2013, I ended up partnering with a company out of New York and became an owner in that company small company, 30 employees, me, a couple partners. And we blew that thing the fuck up. We grew up from 30 to a thousand employees in three years, $200 million company. I mean, really, really blew it up. And the cool thing was when it came to core values was I'd already been messing around with it for a few years. So I hit the ground running with that. And I had this moment, we were probably about 300 employees at this point. And I mean, I grew to 300 employees, 18 months you know, $75 million company from like, this is a $6 million company when I got there. It's a little, little company, you know, in mortgage, that's little, so maybe in other industries, not, but mortgage, that's a small company. And I get there and 300 employees and I'm at a team build and I hear something, Brad, that blows my mind. It was this like uh, next aha moment. Everyone at this team build is talking in the language of our values. They're using them. It's just like, I'm like hearing them and, and they're not doing it to impress me. They're just doing it organically. And I had this moment where I'm like, oh wow, this is it. It's not just about putting words on paper and making people recite them back to you, memorize them. It's about them using them organically because they become viral and sticky and now people do it. That's right. And, and we do this in all parts of our lives. Right. When you think about the things that matter to you and your family and your friends and you watch how people talk, you start to see that there's there's a way that people talk. There's a culture in the way we speak to each other. Those are your values coming to life. But I just hadn't realized until I heard my team doing it. And then I was like, OK, I'm on to something here. And, and all that did is I just tripled down on it. I became more of a fanatic about it than you could possibly possibly imagine. And the company grew and grew and grew. The company grew from 300 to 1,000 employees over the next 18 months. I'm CEO of the company. I'm one of the owners of the company. And, and I'm seeing directly how it affects people's behaviors. What's this company called? It's called The Money Source. Is that a big company? I mean, 1,000 employees, dude, that's a pretty big yeah, company. Yeah, this is top 20 mortgage lender in the United States. So they manage right now about $100 billion in loans. Damn. So yeah. I Are you still with them or no? No, I sold my ownership in it. I got out of it in 2020. So are, you just got a big chunk of change now? Yeah, I'm all right. You know? Um, Did you exit with a big fat check or stock or what? Yeah, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated story. I got a check. Um, and so Did I- Did you I, call your bank account when you got it and just listen to it over and over? You know, it's funny, man. I laid in the pool and it was like the one of the first moments of my life where I was like, holy shit, dude, like- I have zero stress right now. And I had never really like felt that way before. And then you want to hear something fucked up about that is like 30 days later, I felt the same way. I felt stressed again, like for no reason. So I realized oh, something's wrong with me. <laughs> I need, I need to build. I need to do stuff. I need to grind. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, like 
I realize it's a lie that when I get there, something great's going to happen. I'm going to be in this like Nirvana place where I don't have to worry. Like that's not, I think that's a mindset. It's a mindset more than anything else. Um, and, and it's been, it's been interesting. It's been an interesting couple of years, like really like figuring out like, you know, why do I want more? But that's why you wrote the book. You had a lot of free time. You know, I wrote the book before I accidentally actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was a project that, you know, I was, I turned 40 in 2018 and, um, and I, I, for whatever reason, I, I, I just like felt like something was missing in my life. And, and I, and I was like, I'd been thinking about writing that book for a long time. And so I decided to write the book and I spent most of 19 writing the book and I exited it at 2020. So dude, why do you think most businesses core values suck in the first place? You know, it goes back to what we're talking about before. I don't think that they're does number one. I think they're trying to placate to their HR people and marketing people. I think they're trying to be cute. People are like, Hey, look at my core values. It says the word like care. I'm like, like, dude, don't try to be fucking cute. Say what you are. Are you, I think that people need to be aggressive. If you're an aggressive organization, have aggressive core values. Cause when Sally shows up and she's a pacifist, she's not going to like working for your company, you know? And I just think that people are trying to please their clients. I think they're trying to please their team and they're not being authentic to who they are. And if you're CEO and you're doing one thing, but you say you're something else, well, what's that? That's inconsistency. So I think that they're not designed for people to know them. I think they're inconsistent. I think they're not authentic. And I think that they're like overly aspirational to the point where it's not true. It, can, it can't ever be true. And I'm like, did you say what you are? Do you know, you know like uh, the company Uber, right? You know what their number seven core value was? What? Toe stepping. Toe. Travis Kalanick was like, step on fucking toes. Go get after it. Toe stepping? Yeah, toe stepping. Stepping on people's toes. <laughs> I think that one. Yeah. Okay, he, took, he built like one of the most iconic companies of all time. Now, it didn't scale up to a certain point. At a certain point, there was toxic shit going on there. They were doing a bunch of shady stuff. That toe stepping was toxic, you know? And it doesn't it didn't scale, but it scaled until it didn't. But they, at least they were what they were, you know? And I'm like, be who you are. Be unapologetic about it. The world wants people to be un unapologetically who they are. And none of this bullshit we're seeing right now. I love that. I would agree with all of that. So how do you fix it? If you're a company and you got a, if you, if you got your core values twisted, how do you fix it? Yeah. Look, you can read my book. That's a good starting point. Core values folks It's called, let me hold it up here. Bam. Core. The core value equation. A framework to drive results, create limitless scale, and win the war for talent. Ooh, sounds like a damn good title. Thanks, my friend. If you're Appreciate an entrepreneur, you're going to want that book. Where do they get it? Oh, every, everywhere books are sold. You know, Can they go to therealdarius.com? That's another place they can go. Well, you'd save money if they went there. Yeah, you know, like, I think if they go to Amazon, dude, you, you get nothing. <laughs> you get shanked. You get like two bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get it at Amazon, folks. Go support an entrepreneur. Get it at therealdarius.com, D-A-R-I-U-S. Also, if you want to follow this dude on Twitter, at King Darius, on whatever that is. Oh, Instagram, at Woom. Woomp. Oh, Woomp. Dude, you got some... Like, why aren't these all consistent? I know. I, I probably need I need to fix that. It's, it's, a, it's like Woomp. There it is. Woomp Darius. That's funny. <laughs> but... It's, it's again, confusing. You take it from me. You, you want the same one everywhere. I appreciate if, that. If possible. Would okay. you agree? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause other, you, right now you just be a King Darius. Find me a King Darius, which is cool as, as hell. Anyway, why? I'm sure King Darius was available. No, no, it wasn't. You know, I, I you why know, whoop. And, and then how do you spell whoop? W H O O M P. <laughs> so this is an issue. And then this one's the worst one. You're LinkedIn. Yeah, that's my full name. Yeah, like no one is ever going to correctly spell Mershazadeh. But you pronounce it beautifully. Yeah, but nobody's going to be able to spell that. Yeah, fair enough. I could guess and I wouldn't spell it right. <laughs> you, the two silent H's, don't, they, they don't work for you? <laughs> By the way, if you guys got a pen, M-I-R-S-H-A-H-Z-A-D-E-H. <laughs> like no way <laughs> yeah. no one's gonna accidentally find that one no you just gotta go to the real darius you got a blue check mark yet no not yet folks go find him just to just to you won't know which ones how many of them are there how many what 
Darius Mershaza days. Oh, I think there's only one of this. You can't, you can't miss him. Go follow him. All right. Now they can get your book and kitten either from your website or whatever. What about consulting? Yeah. So, so, you know, so I exited the company, sold my ownership and the part of the reason why there's inconsistency with all that stuff is like, I didn't think I was going to be doing personal branding stuff. I was, like I was CEO, you know, CEO running a $200 million company. You know, I'm like, I'm not worried about that. What stuff. was your salary? We, uh, seven figures. Yeah. Fatties. Yeah, they go checks every two weeks. It, it, you know, it, for me, it was all the same. It was just like, I spent a small amount of it and saved the rest. So you hold on to money, invest yeah. it. Yeah, man. I'm, 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 I mean, I told you I had five years. I didn't make any money. When you have five years where you don't make money in my brain's like, dude, maybe I'll have another five years where I don't have any money. So I don't, I don't want to worry about money. So you just save it. Yeah. I like to, I mean, you know, I spend money here and there and some stuff, but I like to save money. I, I mean, I like to see, I like seeing money in the bank. Makes me, makes me sleepy. What was your number one extravagance? Oh, uh, my house. Yeah. Is it fancy? You know, it's a cool house, but I don't know. It was where do like, you live? I live in Austin, Texas. Yeah, I built a house out there. I moved out there about five years ago. Where you uh, planned it and everything? Yeah, I des- we designed the whole thing. That's the dream right there, isn't it? Yeah, it was a bucket list item. And it's, I wake up every day and it's architectural. I got a great architect and I just look around. I'm like, it's on one acre in the middle of the city. I'm like, man, I'm lucky son of a bitch. So, Does everybody know who you are in Austin? No, you know, I think people that know me know me. I, I wasn't there very much when, you know, and then, and then you know, I, I ended up, you know, I, I resigned as CEO of my company in November of 19 and then COVID hit. Now, you know, the freaking co- country was shut down. Um, so you were part of that big CEO step down. Oh, no, I don't know what that is. What do you mean? What did the CEO step down? No. Yeah, like did, right before COVID, like all these CEOs from massive companies stepped down. Oh, you know, yeah, I guess so. I wasn't, I, I wasn't doing it as part of that. I was doing it because I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I was just on my own shit. So I, I was just coincidentally then it was totally, it was just totally coincidental. Okay. You know, but I, but I was in, I was in Austin, it, you know, so yeah, you know, I'm getting to know a lot of people there. I'm getting to know that city a lot. I'm hanging out with a lot more entrepreneurs around there. Um, it's a great town. You make your way out there at all? Yeah. Oh man. It's like Eugene, Oregon to me. I've never been to Eugene, Oregon, but are you from the, you're from the Pacific Northwest, aren't you? I, I've, I've, I haven't been up there. It's, I heard it's like, that's where what U of O is, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like hippie, hippie vibe. A little bit. Yeah. It was when I was there. Yeah. It, it's got a little hippie vibe. It's less now though, since, I mean, I've been going out there. My wife's family's from there. So I've been going out there for like 18 years and it was more of like Texas hippie vibe. And now a lot of people from LA are moving there. Yee. Yeah. A lot of the, it's got that little LA, like, like just like slice to it. It's, it's, I mean, which is cool to a point. Yeah, why not? As long as they don't screw shit up with their rules. <laughs> you know, I lived in San Francisco for 17 years. Go lot, back there. A lot go, of, go check it out. I haven't, I, you know, I go, I go quick. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, dude, that used to be the greatest city ever. Uh, it, it, still, it still will be at some point. Well, someone's got to go in there and clean it up. They're going to have to Giuliani that place. There's people shitting on the floors. That's been going on for a long time. There's, it's just worse. Dude, when I was there, there was no sh- human shit anywhere in the streets. <laughs> Okay, it was a beautiful city. Yeah, it is. It, it has been a beautiful city for many of its years. I I haven't spent much time there since COVID, but it was going downhill before I left. And then I was like, "Get me out of here, man!" Move to Texas, move to Austin, which is a cool town. Yeah, Austin's cool. Cool. Yeah, it's a little trafficy. Yeah, it's getting traffic's worse. a bitch there. I live in the city, so for me, it's like it's like not. I live down by Sixth Street. No, you know that's that's what the Dirty Six. No, you know I live. Um, I live just north of there, you know, like Austin. So Austin's the same size as, as the island of Manhattan. Mm. So do you know Manhattan at all? So it's 11 miles long and two miles wide. So I live about six and a half miles north of downtown, but I'm in, I'm in the, I'm in the rectangle. So it's cool, man. I, I love it. You know, it's a good place to raise my kids and my wife likes it there. We make, make love, people are super friendly there. Um, and it's a cool place to be doing the stuff I'm doing right now. You know, I'm focusing now on since, you know, the world's opening up, I'm focusing now on how can I help entrepreneurs? You know, and that's my passion. It's like, how can I help entrepreneurs and doing it with the book, doing it with the podcast, doing it with scale map and really, oh, yeah, you got a podcast too. His podcast is called the greatness machine. You've had a lot of opportunity to interview badasses there as well. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, that's one of the reasons I came down here. 
hang out with another badass. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's been, it's been, you know, I love learning from people and I love, you know, bringing their learnings to the world. And for me, I'm a learner. So it just, I just absorb the hell out of that stuff. So the podcast has been cool and meeting entrepreneurs and seeing that, man, I'm a, I wasn't, it's not, it's not that I was an idiot. Like it's hard running a company. It's hard scaling a company. It's hard getting your team to show up and crush it and be held accountable. So I made the decision. I was like, you know, man, I'm going to, what can I teach people that I wish someone had taught me? And I started focusing on that and working with entrepreneurs. I work with about 15 different CEOs, um, some in a group setting, some individually, but it's, that's actually how I got hooked up with you. How? Oh. Uh, through, uh, Eddie Perez. Mm, yeah. So Eddie's one of my clients. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie's cool. Yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah, so Eddie hooked me up uh, and he's like, he was talking about you and I was like, man, you gotta make an introduction. So hey, have you ever heard this podcast? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you and I met briefly on clubhouse oh. in the winter of 21 when I lived on that thing for like three months. <laughs> I don't know how people do it, dude. Dude. Like, that takes a lot of time. That clubhouse. Eight weeks where I told my wife, I was like, look, I'm just going to hang out here. So, you know, talking the talk and teaching people and hanging out and being on stages. And did you get a lot of business? You know, I didn't have a, you know, back then I was just coaching CEOs one-on-one. So like, no, like it, it, that I didn't really get business from it. I was just like meeting people. Why don't you go back on there and do it now? I, you know, I, I, I haven't thought about it. You go open up a room, dude, and start talking about your book. They're going to go, where do I get your book? Boom. Sell books. More importantly, run into real people that are like saying same thing I would be, which is dude, I, I would, I mean, I don't know what you charge, but I would definitely be a believer in, Hey, we need to get our core values in order. Yeah. It was funny. So I, so I started, you know, again, this whole digital world of like courses and t teaching and stuff. This is all, I mean, I'm, I'm about as new as you can get to it. You know, maybe I'm a couple years in now, but back then I just didn't know I wasn't doing any of the stuff for that. I was doing it. Cause I was like, Hey, uh, here's a book. My friends want to read, right. Uh, coaching CEOs kind of fell in my lap, but I started figuring out that, Hey man, like I, I learned a lot from the Verns of the world and the Gino Wickman's of the world that, you know, wrote traction and sure. But, but I believe that, that there's some you whole know Gino. I know Gino. Yeah. Tell Gino. I want him on my podcast. Yeah. I've had him on my podcast. I'll get him over on you. Tell Gino. Get him on here. So I learned a lot from these guys, but I also learned what I thought worked better. And so I started figuring out as I'm coaching, you know, Eddie's company is a good example. He's got 500 employees, you know, it's a big company. And I'm in there with him tearing that thing apart and helping him make it better. And I was like, you know, I, I guess I have my own system. I mean, yeah, there's, you know, you stand on the shoulder of giants like Vern and Gino and you learn from them, but, but what are the things that I do different? And I started figuring out that, man, I do it different. I don't do everything the same way. Values. I have my way of doing values. How do I build scale systems? How do we do meetings? How do we do strategy? How do we do KPIs in the company? How do you build a culture of execution in your company where GSD shit gets done? You know, you get shit done in your company. And I just figured out that, man, I just do it differently. And I started working with entrepreneurs and seeing that, man, they're learning quickly and they're implementing quickly and their companies are transforming right in front of me. And that was different than building a mortgage bank or mortgage building a big servicing portfolio. That was for me, super gratifying. And so I spent the, the, the latter part of the last year really diving into that launching scale map method, which is my new scale system and really working with entrepreneurs on saying, Hey man, how can you grow your company? Because I, th I think a lot of these people, Brad, what they do is they focus like there's like, there's so much sexiness around marketing and there's so much sexiness around, um, strategy, right? Mm -hmm. People want to talk strategy. You talk to CEOs, they want to talk strategy. Why? Cause we're strategic. We want to talk about strategy. So the gurus go out there and they start placating to that. Hey, let's talk strategy. Let's talk about your vision and all the big stuff you want to do. And you got to do that stuff. But, but the team's got to do the work. And what I find is there's, especially as you scale, you know, 20, 30, 50, hundred employees, 200 employees, 500 employees, thousand employees, you know, most people aren't going to get to that size, but hundred employees, a lot of employees, 50 employees, a lot of employees tell I was having my biggest brain damage moments at 30 employees when I, when I was first learning. But what I realized was everyone's talking about, Hey, Hey Brad, what's your, what's light speeds, you know, greatest differentiating value proposition, right? Have you ever been asked that before? Yep. What is it? interactivity. Okay. 
And so everyone ha- figures out what that is. And you've been around for a while, so so you've had time to really like figure it out. I don't know if that's you know a good answer that you'd help come up with if we were to engage your services. I just know that the facts, the facts are the real difference between Lightspeed and all these other bullshit hosting solutions that are out there that they call, you know, training systems. They're not training systems. They're, they're video hosting solutions, right? Lightspeed is the only actual learning technology that's designed to get you to learn what's in it. And it's the only one that allows you to create interactive content with it. So in other words, you take video, turn it into interactive video, right? And interactive video allows you to ask questions and respond accordingly, as well as make offers. So if I sent somebody through your course, I could literally gather data and make offers. So by mm. the time they're done, they're already upsold where, where normally you would sell them your video. Cause that's what the other ones host. Right. And then you'd have to follow up and market to them to buy more stuff, engagement, right. consulting, whatever. Well, why would you make them watch a video and then follow up afterwards to see if they like it? Why wouldn't you just embed the upsell and the offers and the, and the, right. and the value within the course itself while well, they're taking it. Yeah. So, so light is the only one that does that. So yeah. that, that interactivity is the true differentiator, even though we got communities and leaderboards and all this other shit that, that true learning, you know, uses, but besides all the different features and, and whatnot, the true real difference differentiator is interactivity. So you clearly have a cool product, right? There's no question about that. And you're a great company. Most people like talking about that stuff where I find, I believe the greatest differentiating value proposition out and you do a technology business, which is, this is maybe not as true for tech. Cause I think tech product rules, like you got to have a good product, right? Well, I also have RV dealerships and other companies. So tell me the secret and let me see if it applies to those. Yeah. I think it's going to apply more to those. I believe the greatest differentiating value proposition people. It, well, people's part of it is execution is can you go and get it done? When you say you're going to get it done, does it get done? And does that scale as you scale? If you go from one dealership to three dealerships, does it happen the same way at each dealership, the same way, same time, same how? When people say they're going to do something, does it happen? Everyone gets so, they want to talk about the sexy stuff. They want to talk about strategy and, oh, let's go do this new stuff. And we see it as entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, we talk, call it, what, entrepreneurial, uh, you know, shiny object syndrome. Je ne sais quoi. <laughs> But we see it all the time. And my take is like, no, no, no. The greatest differentiating value proposition is execution. Can my team show up and get it done faster than your team? Better than your team? To your point, people. But good people with bad execution, it happens. And I believe that a good scale system embeds that in there. And the thing that I figured out with scale map method is one thing, one thing only. You've got to make it easy or else the team won't do it. Same with core values. To your point earlier, like you have 12 values, 70, 80 words, they're just not gonna, it's not easy. They won't remember it. They'll have to pull up the piece of paper and look at it. And I'm like, there's a word in Japanese called shibui. Have you ever heard of this word before? No. It means that there's complexity and simplicity. But I had some. You had a mame and shibui last night. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's complexity and simplicity. We got to make it simple. I want the team to do it. I don't want them to have to figure it out, pull out some manual and learn it. I got to make it easy. It sounds like you've done that with your technology. You make it easy so that people no, can it's actually, it's, it's actually not that easy. That's where we screwed up. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but human beings, human beings, it's want- like throwing the keys to a jet. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, you know, not really, really, but kind of like, I, in other words, I can give you the light speed platform right now for you to go build courses and do your thing and you'll build courses and do your thing. But then you'll sit with me and I'll be like, why didn't you do this, 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 yeah. this, this? And you're going to go, well, how would I have known to do that? And I would say, well, you just got to know. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. the bad part. Yeah. So all we fail to do sometimes is to transfer all the kick-ass knowledge to the new customer. So what do we do to solve it? Well, we built courses that are inside of it, but then people won't go through the courses. It's the same old shit, you know, when, you, when yeah. it comes to training. But what I'm curious when you say the, the scale map method, that's how to scale your company? Yeah, so it's my, if you go look at an EOS, which is Gino Wickman, or you yeah. look at scaling up, which is Vern, that's my version of, uh, it's my version of a scaling system. So break it down real quick. Yeah, so there's, so th- I figured out that, that there's really three things we care about when we're an entrepreneur. Where are we going? So M stands for mission. Where am I going as an entrepreneur? And we break that into two parts. One is, I call rise targets 
which is how, what's your revenue, what's your income, what's your staff size, and what are your ethics? And we want to set goals around those over short-term, mid-term, and long-term. One-year goals, three-year goals, 10-year goals. 10 why? I want lean into the future. Go, go make your dreams happen, right? And I just want to identify what those are because so many entrepreneurs and businesses, they don't, they'll either make these ornate plans that no one pays attention to, or they don't have a plan. And I'm like, no, let's figure out what, how much revenue you're trying to build, how much money you got, need to make. Cause you got to turn a profit unless you're some, you know, VC funded startup, you know, how many humans do you need there? And, and are you going to create some bad problems when you're building that or not? So we got to have ethics targets. After that, what I want to do is I want to build a quarterly plan, right? And, and everyone makes this shit hard. And I'm like, no, make it easy. So we have a process where we teach them how to do a quarterly plan. We call it a four by four growth map. What are the four things you need to focus on with your team over the next quarter? And you got to meet four times a year to do it. Every 13 weeks, boom, 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 boom. So now you got your plan. I know where I'm going short term, midterm, long term. I know I'm going this quarter. I'm good, right? Supposedly. Yeah. That paper is good as the, that, or that plan is good as the paper it's written on, unless you have accountability and execution in your company. So the A in map, there we go. Oh, I love it. I was hoping I'd get some bombs when I was on here today. I listened to your Ed Milet show and I was like, I'm going to get some bombs. <laughs> so A is for accountability. Why? Because I, I make that plan happen. And the way I see it is in most businesses, we don't know who's, who owns what, and we don't have a system to hold people accountable. So we have a segment called rule of one org chart, which is a strategic org chart that has accountability baked into it. And it has one simple rule. Everyone can only report to one person who holds them accountable. This is all about accountability, right? Secondly, we have a thing called 1590 meeting rule, which is there's really only two meetings you need to have in your company. You need daily huddle. You need a weekly accountability meeting. Daily huddles around what needs to happen for that individual, for that team, for that daily in the daily huddle, right? No more than 15 minutes. And then we have our quarterly plan. Well, here's what most people do. Most entrepreneurs, they do their quarterly plan and then they go back to work. I call that BAU, business as usual. And, and then 13 weeks later, they're like, oh, did we do the plan? You know, we get stuff done there and they'll pull it up and they'll take a look and maybe they did, maybe they didn't. And I'm like, hell no. You need to be looking at that every five business days. Did you actually say hell no? I probably said fuck no, but <laughs> uh, I have potty mouth, so I, I talk how I think. So what we do is we do a 90-minute meeting once a week. Every five business days, you show up. You're either on track or off track. You either got shit done or you didn't get shit done on those projects you said you're going to get done for the quarter. And we have heavy accountability of what needs to happen in the business. And then last but not least is, is a meeting we call 30 Every 30. And, and what I find, especially with working with entrepreneurs now, is most people don't do one-on-ones in their businesses. It's either casual, yeah, oh, yeah, I took them to lunch or I hang out with them or they have the really regimented and what ends up happening is the team doesn't get fed. Your team wants feedback from you. So we built a, a, a framework called 30 over 30 where you're meeting with them, you're assessing what's going on in their world, you're helping them overcome their roadblocks and the team gets fed, mm. right? So now I have accountability, right? Everyone, we got a plan, we got accountability, GSD, shit's getting done, good stuff. Traction. So traction is no pun intended. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're getting traction in your business. To That's your why point. I like Gino's book. Yeah. So he's think, got, he's got a clever way of, of, of laying it all out. I mean, I, I, there's always more than one way to skin a cap, but dude, I guarantee you if someone can do what you're talking about, they will get going. They will progress. Oh, without a doubt. And, and I learned from Gino, you know, my G90 meeting, the 90 minute weekly is a, I don't want to say a better version of an L10, but he has a level 10 meeting. It's my version of the L10 because I ran L10s and I tweaked them and tweaked why, them. And tweaked why don't them. you want to say better version? Man, I feel bad talking trash on other people's systems. That's not talking trash about I, their system. You're I just think, saying yours is better. I think he's got a good system. I know, but do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, fair enough. I think that our G90 minute meetings are better. Yeah, because you I, would because you authored it. And I'm sure Gino would argue because he thinks his L10s are better. But if he didn't, I wonder if Gino would be the type of person to alter his L10s to now reflect his new beliefs, which is, damn, Darius figured out a better way of doing it. I don't know. You know, maybe uh, my issue with the L10s is there's too much conversation around, you know, woo woo stuff and too much bullshit like, around. Give me a win. Yeah, I don't mind them to give me a win. I mind when we spend 20 minutes talking about strategy and we still haven't figured out why we're not getting shit done. Well, I like that better. 
you know, I can tell you, I've, I've, I've tried to implement the traction shit around here. Dude, I got too many cry babies. They, they say that, you know, the leader's the problem. So I've taken full responsibility. <laughs> I yeah. am, I am the problem with the leadership goes the organization. Yeah, what I need is someone to come in and just say, okay, boom, and take over that part for me. I'm a visionary. Yeah. So you need your integrator. To I need own an integrator. That shit. But, need- but then again, it's hard to get an integrator into the company from outside and then put them in charge of people been here years. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, why would the person that been here years teach them what's supposed to be happening? I thought the integrator is supposed to know everything. Yeah, it's well, and then they might run to daddy and say, hey, it, it always happens. Yeah, and they run like, to oh, there's a bitch because everyone's a whiny bitch. Like sometimes I'd start the L10s and be like, OK, let, let's hear a win. And people would be like, um, yeah, and I'm thinking, dude, you can't think of anything positive. You don't have any wins in your life. And they're um, you don't come prepared. So it just became a negative thing talking about the wins. It's like, look, like coming up with wins was a negative. Yeah. You got, well, so the, the way by how I would recommend overcome that is I say business or personal win. I don't need it. You know, what's something cool to happen in your family this weekend? You know, it's about p- pumping positivity in the room and I want it to be quick. We don't want you to spend much time on that shit. Let's move on. So, so, so in reality, it's not even sincere that we're asking, you know, I do think that, Cause that it's like, come on. Five seconds. No one really gives a shit. No. Just say something positive. No, no. It's it's about don't let's not overcomplicate it. It's not about not being sincere because I think that is about being. What's sincere. your win today? My win today is being on dropping bombs. Hey, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is my win of my week. That's what you call <laughs> quick, quick witted. Yeah, that was good, good answer. A layup. <laughs> good, good answer. <laughs> but yeah, so 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 why would I say it's better? What I say is, look, man, strategy is fun. We talk strategy. Look, you want to strategize, man? I love strategy. I'll talk strategy with you all day long. We have idea sex, talk about all that stuff. But it's like, why why are we talking about that first when things aren't getting done in the business? And what's, I, what's idea sex? Did you oh, say that? Yeah, I just said idea sex. What is idea sex? Idea sex is like me and my business partner just throwing around ideas and just bullshitting and coming up with ideas. It's a James. It's another Al- word for brainstorming. Yeah, yeah. It's James Altucher. It's a, he came up with that word. What's it called again? It's, uh, his name idea G- sex. Yeah, idea sex. I, I don't I, like that. <laughs> what if it's you and a couple of buddies? Ah, you know, it's have a, an idea sex. It, it's it's a provocative statement. You know, oh dude, it just you threw the word sex in there, which means now I can only do it with the females. <laughs> you can have idea sex with females. I, well, I, I'd love to. Problem is, is I you know I have idea sex with men too. According yeah. according to you, yeah. That's why I'm going to refuse to call it idea sex. <laughs> Like I'm calling it brainstorming. Actually, I call it Brad storming. Brad storming. Same thing. It's it, it potato potato. Folks, you can choose what you want to call it. You can call it idea sex. You can call it Brad storming. You can call it brainstorming. I prefer Brad storming. So if I'm ever you know chopping shit up with you, coming up with ideas, throwing shit around, spitballing. Okay. Don't ever don't ever say we had idea sex. No. If you're a just, dude, just a shit ton of Brad storming. Brad storming all day long. Yeah. You see, now I just improved your shit. Dude. See? Learn something new every day. Are you ever gonna say idea sex again? Probably. You should not. <laughs> you leave that to J- James Al Shooter. <laughs> James Al Schluter. What's his name? James, I think it's James Altucher. Yeah. Yeah. He's got Leave it to him. Yeah. Dude, what's your what's your idea sex for in, in this book? In that book, it's it's real simple. You gotta make it easy. If you want for, for core value equation, no, I mean the, the, a term or a phrase that you coined. Oh yeah. If I read your book, what would, what would your idea sex be? Where I'd be like, you know, Darius calls it. Oh, you know, I don't know if I did that. I just, I mean, the core value equation is kind of, kind of an idea sex. So so basically the, the, the equation is that every result in our life is derived from our values. And so, I had done some coaching work with a, a good friend of mine and basically his whole belief system is our conversations equals our decisions equals our actions equals our results. And after doing that work with them, I was thinking about it. I said, well, if your core values have the opportunity to become the conversation, you know, of our business, of our lives, if, if w- that is what's driving the conversations that's happening in our business, for example, then wouldn't the core values equal the conversations? And if the core values equals conversations equals decisions equals actions equals results. There's this law. It's called the law of transitive equality in math. A equals B, B equals C, C equals D, D equals E, A equals E. So the, so I think that's, that would be the, the idea that would come out of the book. 
is what conversations are you having? Personal life, business, friends, and those conversations, they're driving your results. And the minute I got clear on that, I started really paying attention. I'm like, what conversations are happening up here? What conversations are happening right here? And do I like them? Are they the ones I want to have happening? Like, great, like right now I can tell you this is a good conversation, right? But we have all sorts of conversations and I've, felt, I've spent the last probably five years aggressively eliminating the conversations in both my business life and my personal life that did not serve my values. And that's been a game changer. So now you're a small consulting firm, basically. Yeah. It's, you it's, you it's, gave up the CEO positions. You're not running any big companies. You're just helping entrepreneurs get their shit in order. Yeah. You know, I spent the, la- the greater part of the last three years just you know, investing pa- post my exit you know, so spending time doing a lot of investing and working with entrepreneurs, you know, and that's been, that's, I always loved entrepreneurs. I mean, I don't really love mortgage that much. I'm good at mortgage. I know mortgage. A lot of my clients. Well, dude, why don't you focus in on the best entrepreneur on the planet? Boom. I just need my team. Yeah. See, I got the vision from the gods, the visionary, even though, you know, in my mind, they're all great ideas. None of them are worth a dime until you execute. Exactly. So like people listening, execution's key. You know the difference between massive companies and massive ideas? All execution. Period. Yeah, no question. All these massive ideas go nowhere. Massive companies were ideas at one point that that someone took action on. Yeah, I think people overcomplicate this stuff. Yeah, but but, I mean, not really because like, dude, Core values, you, you got to realize things or, or learn things, one of the two. Of course. And the only thing I realize is like, these are true, but I always know that like, you know, I got good posters out there and I'm sure someone here can memorize them because I'll spiff people if they can sometimes, mm-hmm. but that's just memorizing. Do I think that we are all operating like this? The answer is no. And I think if you asked every employee, do you operate like this? Like seriously, they're going to say no. That to me is the problem. Yeah. So I need someone to come in and say, dude, these are great fucking core values. Now let's figure out how to get everybody to actually execute and believe in them mm-hmm. to where, to where we police ourselves. And now all of a sudden you've built a culture. Oh yeah. And if you're not honoring your core values, number one, if you don't know what they are, you got a problem. Yeah. Then they're not alive. Yeah. Number two, you got to identify them for sure. Absolutely. But number two, if you know what they are, but you're not doing it, that's a problem. For so, sure. you, cause I know a lot of people that I got my core values. I yeah. can recite them. My, my employees can recite them. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Are they, if you took them to the side, would they tell you, oh yeah, this is paramount. And if, and if your core values are not paramount, in other words, if, if, if you don't have to operate by your core values, well then you don't have a culture worth having. Yeah, because to me, having a good culture, having a culture is really just a as a behavior that's accepted. So so Mm -hmm. if I say, hey, we're going to communicate and you don't communicate, you're going against our core values. That's a behavior I can't accept. So a culture is just a group of accepted behaviors. Completely. Yeah. So so like I need to figure out how to get whatever you do, the magic you do with these to where they're not just words anymore. They're not, it's not just a list, clever little list. It's like, it's like a core value. No pun intended. (laughs) Like everybody believes in it. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, I think it's not this, it's not this monumental moment where like all of a sudden they're alive and well, like you probably, how many, how big is your team? How many people you got? 83. Okay. So here, Right. Other companies different, but these aren't other companies. Right, right. For this, for this group. So, so at 83, like you're, you know, you're under that 150 mark, you know, and they say like 150 is kind of like the, the size of a tribe before things start to dilute, right? They start to break up after that. Um, and so I, I always look at a company and I say, Hey, look, thousand person company is really, you know, a hundred tens, a hundred groups of 10. And if you think of how managers manage more, no person can really manage more than 10 people at a time. So really what it is is we need to get it out there you and we need to make it where it becomes organically happening throughout the organization and the book kind of walks you throughout how you do that because to your point that is the that is the glue that's how we hold it all together that's i, I want people that are going to show up and make those things come to life and when they don't it's real simple they don't get to be here there's other places for them to go this isn't the right environment for them 
But what happens is, is since most people don't do a great job of making them come to life, then we can't hold people accountable to them. I told you earlier, I said the fifth step is measuring to make sure they're, that they're actually causing some effect here. Part of that is making sure that we're recruiting to values. Part of that is making sure that we're ma managing the values. But we, like, as a CEO, especially if you're a visionary, it's like, man, like that's not going to be your strength. So we have to build an organization where things get done. And that's, that's really where going back to scale map is like, look, that is the vessel for accountability, mission, accountability. I didn't mention the last part, which is performance. And we're talking about that right now. I need to measure for performance. Everything I talk about, I didn't tell the you, you have to, you have to, we do it in sales, by the way, no problem. We measure for perform performance. We don't let people meander in sales. You hit your numbers, you're out. Do I used to take over companies and tri triple their, their results? And everyone would say, how did you do it? One of the very first things I would do is put in measurements of performance. Like how many customers did we get on the lot? How many of them talked to a manager? You know, numbers. How many did you sell? How many, you know, how many people did you talk to? How many phone calls did you make? Those stats, if you don't know those stats, those stats, you're not serious about managing shit. Right. But we do it in sales, but we don't do it in the other places that count. Well, we how do you measure a receptionist? I would do it off NPS, net promoter score. Which means now I got to call all my customers. How do I, I, how do I measure that job? Yeah. So, so the one, pretty the, soon you got a fucking million jobs. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm again, going back to what I said before, I tend to oversimplify everything. So can I measure the receptionist is, do I need to have, do I need to measure every, every single person that way? Maybe, maybe not. I just want everyone to be adults. Like you'll see in the green room, there's a beer tap and yeah. some alcohol. There's a bar out in my lobby. People are like, do you let your employees drink? And I'm, and I say, if they want one, right. They're like, you let your employees drink while they're working. And I said, is it against the law? They're like, no. And I'm like, well, then why would I tell them they can't do something here? Right. That's legal to do. Like, dude, they're grown people. Yeah. They want to have a drink, have a drink. Someone goes, well, what if they get drunk? Then I'd get rid of them. Then they can't be here. Yeah, because idiots get drunk. Yeah, exactly. And see, see the difference? Yeah, so you were talking about is culture, right? But going back to what we were talking about before is you can measure all the, the things you need to measure in your business. We don't need to over measure. It doesn't mean analysis paralysis. I want to measure is accountability happening. I want to measure my customer experience. I want to measure my team experience. Macro, you're either going to get good scores, you're going to get mediocre scores, you're going to get shit scores. Those are the three things. If they're good, you're good. If they're mediocre, improve them to good. If they're shit, you better improve them a lot. And then I could start to dig in and figure out, oh, my receptionist doesn't do that good of a job. How do I know? Dude, man, I used to call my receptionist see how many rings. If there was more than three rings, we had a problem. Well, what if she was taking a shit? Yeah, shit happens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what uh, if she was getting coffee for a customer? Yeah, she should have some rings. Like, you can't get measure a receptionist on rings. No, you can I'm measure, giving an example. You can, you can measure a receptionist by observation. Sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't now, disagree now, by the that. way, in part, because feedback and all that other stuff, of course. Right. But how I measure mine is observation. Yeah. When I get off the elevator and walk through the door, is she smiling brightly? If I walk in, if a customer walks in that she's never met before, does she greet them properly and introduce herself yeah. and make them feel at home? And so when people leave here and they're like, oh, your staff's so awesome. That's how I measure them. Yeah. I give her a 10, by the way. Good. She was super friendly when I walked in. That's right. So, so the other, the other day I, I, she didn't know I was listening to her and somebody walked in and, um, you know, you could tell they were kind of like a little bit nervous or, or, or lost. And she goes, hi, I'm Shannon. Welcome to Life Speed. You know, yeah. it just took over. I'm like, see, no, that's that's a good one right there. Yeah, and as long and do we have 82 other people that mimic that, right? The que that's the question, and I would probably guess that you don't, because most people don't. Well, maybe one of these days I'll let you come in and run through the the crew and see if we can't improve the spot. Yeah, so you, I can be like a testimonial for you. I'll give you, I'll give you a, I'll give you an assessment that you can run through your organization and I'll, for fun and, and it, that I've built. I call All it the right. full body scan. It's one of the things I do with some of my clients. Um, and we'll see. It'll All be right. fun. So what, 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 could, what about the bomb squad? You, you want to do a full body scan for everybody? Uh, we could, we bombs. What's the bomb squad? That's the listeners. Oh, you Dude, know, you what? may not know it, but you're going to be listened to by a shit ton of people. Yeah. And they own businesses. Yeah. Uh, I would say your business might blow up.
Uh, dude, I'm down for that. So no, they, they can go check out DariusClass.com, which is where I talk about scale map, but we want to measure for performance. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I come from mortgage, right? My business partners were hard. They weren't a bunch of culture loving, you know, core value driven leaders. They were core value people. They have good values, but they weren't like, this is, this is what I did as CEO of the company. My, my partners were hardcore cut and dry bankers. So I had approved to them all this stuff that I did, you know, to, we didn't talk about my last company. My company was best place to work. I was number nine highest rate CEO in America on Glassdoor, all the good things. Dude, right? We're going we're gonna to have to come back for a part two. <laughs> but I got that way because we got shit done. And my partners, the reason they let me do that stuff. Why don't you come work here? Why don't you let me hire you and come oh. get shit done here? <laughs> I'm unemployable, man. I told you when I was at the White House. Why though? We, we could talk about me helping. Why, why are you unemployable? Because I'm such an entrepreneur. Like, I don't Because you like to do what you want when you want. 100%. I like to help people, though. And I, and I help them. You know, most of my clients are guys like you running badass companies. And I'm their, I'm their right hand. I'm there to help them. You know, that's what I do. You know, I'm like consigliere. You know, so it's. Do you know Jay Duran? Yeah, I was on Jay's show. That's how I know you is through right. his wife. Yeah. Jay's a stud. Yeah, Jay's funny. He's a culture expert. Yeah, he loves culture. He gets deep into that, doesn't he? Yeah, he, he you he, and him together could be a double double team on on Eddie. Yeah, Eddie says that uh, Jay's his left arm and I'm his right arm. There you go. <laughs> uh, Jay's more of the culture. I, I I believe in culture, but I come at it from a performance metric standpoint. Like we got to hit numbers. You don't build a two hundred million dollar company because you'd put on a pink unicorn suit and you know trot around and make people feel good. That's part of it. People got to feel good, but they got to get shit done. So I, I, I learned two things in growing companies and working with someone like Vern and working with guys like um, Gino and learning what they learned and then making it my own. I learned that core values are the foundation because of the fundamental beliefs of the organization, but you've got to build a system to get shit done. And you got to know where you're going. You got to have accountability and you got to measure for, for, for performance. And that's exactly what I built with scale map. Folks. If you want to follow this dude, you better go to his social media at King Darius at Whoop Darius. Just go to the real Darius.com. I'm sure you can follow him there or Google Darius Mershazadeh, M I R S H A H Z A D E H. Anything to the bomb squad before we sign on? Yeah. Um, first of all, man, thanks for having me on the dude, show. Thanks for coming, dude. This is, this is really fun. Um, yeah, look, anyone that wants to learn more, obviously they, they can go check out that stuff, but I have a free training, 30 minute training on scale map and we're doing a boot camp coming up in October. You go to dariusclass.com, D-A-R-I-U-S class.com and, uh, check out the training. And if you want to learn more, you can sign up and, uh, learn more there. Yeah. And if you're listening to this after October, then you missed it till next time. Kids keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.